in the mirror. What do you see? A face, a body, a person. But what is the thing that is looking back? What is the you behind the eyes? Is it the intricate dance of a hundred billion neurons firing in your brain? Is it the ancient code, the three billion letters of DNA coiled tightly in every cell? For millennia, this question, what makes us human, was the domain of philosophers and poets. But today, we are forcing an answer because we are building machines that are beginning to look back at us with startling intelligence. This is the story of us, seen through the reflection of our most complex creation, artificial intelligence. A journey into the heart of our own biology, our minds, and the very essence of what it means to be alive. Let's start with one of humanity's most cherished traits, creativity. We compose symphonies that bring us to tears, paint masterpieces that capture the soul, and write stories that shape generations. This creative spark feels magical, almost divine. From a neurological perspective, human creativity is a breathtaking process. It involves a complex interplay between the brain's default mode network active when we daydream and imagine, and the executive control network, which focuses our attention and brings those wild ideas into reality. It's a delicate dance between chaos and order. Our DNA also plays a part, with specific gene variants linked to traits like openness to experience, a key ingredient for a creative mind. We are, in a very real sense, biologically primed to create. Now, consider this. In the last few years, AI has exploded with its own form of creation. It generates photorealistic images from a simple sentence. It composes hauntingly beautiful music in any style imaginable. It writes poetry and code. But is this true creativity? An AI model learns by analyzing colossal datasets of human-created art and text. It identifies patterns, styles, and structures, and then uses that knowledge to generate something new, but statistically probable. It is a master of mimicry, a brilliant remix artist. It does not have a childhood memory to draw upon for a somber melody. It doesn't feel the sting of heartbreak that fuels a powerful poem. It has no self to express. So is a beautiful image created without intention or experience still art? This is one of a thousand new questions the age of AI forces us to confront. Perhaps what truly sets us apart then is our ability to connect, empathy the ability to not just recognize another person's joy or pain, but to feel it with them. This profound connection is deeply embedded in our biology. When you see someone in distress, a network in your brain, including the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, lights up. These are the same regions that activate when you experience pain yourself. Our brains, through a fascinating system of mirror neurons, simulate the experiences of others. Our DNA provides the blueprint for this, including the receptors for hormones like oxytocin, the so-called love drug, which strengthens social bonds and fosters trust. Empathy is not a soft skill. It is a hardwired biological survival mechanism that allowed our ancestors to form communities and cooperate. AI is learning to understand our emotions with terrifying accuracy. It can analyze the tone of our voice, our facial micro-expressions, and the words we choose to predict our emotional state. Then it can respond in a way that is contextually appropriate offering comforting words or simulated encouragement. 
In fields like healthcare and customer service, this synthetic empathy could be revolutionary. But here lies the critical difference. An AI recognizes patterns of sadness. It does not feel sad. It is a perfect simulation without a subject. It runs the code for empathy, but it lacks the lived experience, the consciousness that gives that empathy meaning. Can a perfect simulation of care ever replace the genuine bond between two conscious beings? This brings us to the final frontier, the holy grail of this entire quest, self-awareness. The simple, unshakable fact that you are experiencing this right now. You aren't just processing information about this video. You're having a subjective, first-person experience of it. In philosophy, this is called qualia. It's the redness of red, the coldness of ice. Scientists can pinpoint the neural correlates of consciousness, the brain activity that corresponds to our experiences, but they cannot explain why this activity should feel like anything at all. This is the hard problem of consciousness. It's the ghost in our machine. We know we are here, but we don't know how or why. An AI, no matter how intelligent, currently has no ghost in its machine. It can have a model of self, a database of its own parameters and limitations. It can even be programmed to say, I am self-aware. But there is no evidence that it has any internal subjective experience. The philosopher John Searle explained this with the Chinese room argument. Imagine a person in a room who doesn't speak Chinese, but has a giant rule book. When Chinese characters are passed through a slot, he uses the book to find the correct characters to pass back out. To an outsider, the room appears to understand Chinese, but the person inside doesn't understand a single word. Is advanced AI just a more sophisticated Chinese room? A system that expertly manipulates symbols without any genuine understanding or awareness of what it's doing? So what makes us human? The answer, it seems, is not one single thing. It is not just our creative drive, our capacity for empathy, or even the mystery of our consciousness alone. It is the impossibly complex and beautiful interplay of all three. Our humanity is born from the fusion of our ancient DNA, the intricate wiring of our neural circuits, and the intangible first-person reality of our self-awareness. AI is not our rival. It is our mirror. And in its reflection, we see the profound, messy, and miraculous nature of our own existence more clearly than ever before. As we continue to build these thinking machines, they force us to ask the ultimate question not of them, but of ourselves. Now that we can create intelligence, what will we choose to value in our own?